to many people, the idea of retirement is sitting back in a beach, you know, in a beach chair or something, by the pool, drinking a pina colada, just taking life easy, enjoying the hard work, of many years of many years of employment, many years of stress, many years of getting up early in the mornings and all that sort of stuff. Well, look, in some countries they've got places like Florida, like the whole of Florida seems to be dedicated, I'm sliding down this chair now, the whole of Florida is dedicated to, um, to retirement villages and golf courses. It's quite amazing. Um, and Australia doesn't really have it because the places where there's really nice warm weather are so bloody expensive that no one can afford to stay there. And certainly if you're retiring on a bit of superannuation and a pension, you're not going to have enough money to really really just enjoy the, the best part of your life. So look, a lot of people have been asking me lately, can you retire or can, what's the story about living in Bali? I'm sort of semi-retired, I guess, a bit myself. I've been living over here for a year. I'm living um, with uh, my family in a local village, and it's certainly not what you would consider the, the Ritz. It's, um, it's very humble and very small a little environment, but there are lots of things to talk about when we talk about retiring. So I'll tell you what, oh, get up out of my beach chair. <laughs> I can, hang on. Oh. Oh. It's amazing how many people have asked me about about moving to Bali and about the situation, the system. What do you have to do to come and live in Bali? And why would you not want to live in Bali? This place is just beautiful, nice weather. I tell you, you do acclimatise to it really quickly. I've been here for a year and beautiful hot sunny day or warm sunny day just feels nice and temperate to me. I'm outside, I've got a beer. The sky's nice and blue. Middle of the wet season, so it's not quite as steamy as it can be in the, in the dry season. Sometimes it get, the temperature gets up above 30 degrees, but generally you're in the mid to high 20s and down overnight you're sort of, you're never getting much below about, I guess, 18 degrees Celsius. So the climate's nice. And then, let's face it, the houses are built for the warm climate, so they nearly all have fans or air conditioning um, to keep you nice and dry. Um, and there's a whole heap of things that you need to stop and think about when it comes to the decision whether or not you want to move to or to or retire in Bali. There is the visa situation. So immigration is look. I'm going to try and I'm going to do a series of videos. There's so much information to cover off here. Accommodation, immigration, um, insurance the physical limitations of, of being here, the, the advantages and disadvantages that many, many uh, expats find after coming over here. Um, there's people that come here to invest and to build, buy a property or to, um, to build a business over here. Um, and I'm gonna be talking to them. So what I'm gonna try and do is break this up into, into several segments about where to go, how to get here, what the requirements are and please take this as a guide only because I promise you whatever I say as far as regulations or or information is it's only from what I've been told and the requirements and the regulations change quite regularly so I will be giving you some some pointers and some some information on where you can go to get official information this is not verbatim this is not legally binding because nothing over here, everything takes time. So that's one thing you need to know. The first thing that you get used to is barley time. I don't wear a watch, no point. You don't need a watch because some will see in the afternoon, they'll just turn up whenever they're ready. Whenever they get through the traffic, you don't make appointments at 2.15 generally because the chances are there's not gonna be there when you get there. Um, and that's a beautiful thing about living in Bali. You don't need, you're not married to your time pieces. You're not married to, to a schedule you're just growing up waking up going for a walk along the beach going doing yoga by the as the sun rises over Sanua beach or something there's also location is a big thing i'm going to try and cover off some of the areas because look if you've come over here a few times as a as a, a tourist then your experience as a tourist is nothing like your experience as a resident 
um, where you stay. You're not going to be staying in a hotel for the rest of your life. It's, it becomes cost prohibitive and, and it's not going to give you a really good uh, alternative. It's not a good option compared to the people that you meet and the camaraderie you'd, you'd have in a retirement village or in, in, a, in a community location in Australia then you're not going to have that sustained level of friends and people that, that you network with. Um, and that's a really, really important thing to take to consideration when you're moving to a whole other country. You're going to have your family sitting there freaking out about, about you, where you are and what you're doing. And look, my daughter is, is sitting there saying, Dad, when are you coming home? And are you going to retire to Bali or are you going to run away and, and leave us uh, back home in Australia? And it is a huge, a, a huge thing. Um, I don't necessarily have the money to retire anywhere near the same level of comfort in Australia as I do here in Bali because what I can purchase or how I can live the lifestyle I can live here in Bali is so much above and beyond the lifestyle that I can be afforded in back at home so so there's that's a big big consideration and something that all of this has to be weighed up and I'm not here to, to give you recommendations I've seen a lot of people go home disappointed and and I know a lot of people that have lived here for 10 20 30 years and love it to death but they've overcome some some difficulties in doing it so I'm gonna do a whole session on on uh, visas and the legality side of things but one of the ways of being of justifying coming to <laughs> sorry coming to Bali is to invest to buy a property to form a company um, or and to to put some some money down something for your future and something that that put something back into the community of Bali and I do know uh, quite a number of people that have come over here with the intention of building bars and nightclubs and hotels and uh, restaurants and everything you can imagine and every single one of them has run into brick walls in different times and a good percentage of them managed their way through the brick walls but but not without some very financially hazardous circumstances so if you're coming over here as an investor and you don't have billions of dollars or no, if you're not if you're coming over here without hundreds of thousands of dollars in your pocket um, then then do a lot of homework and I promise you the worst part of it is the people that you ask the questions to will tell you a part of the story but they won't tell you the whole story and halfway through they'll say it's, this is only going to cost two or three hundred thousand rupiah or whatever um, and then you've spent that money and they say, okay, and now we need something else. And then we need something else. And, and look, it can cripple you. It really, really can. And if you don't have a good financial package back at home to, to fall back to, you could end up doing the dollar, your dollars and walking away. There's another one that needs to be said, and, and I'm not trying to put bad light on anyone over here or anyone over there, but there are a lot of gullible single men that come over here thinking they've found their happy ever after. And there, there are girls over here that will give you the whole girlfriend experience and then you go back home and they'll give someone else that girlfriend experience a few weeks later. And some of these some of these people have a, new, a number of sugar daddies or whatever you want to call them who have helped them support their families, pay for their kids' you know, university or um, school fees or whatever. And, and they turn up and they find out that they're not the only guy. Or, what, and it's, it does happen all the time, and I, I can't remember how many people have told me this, they've got married over here, they've found a partner who wants an easy life, they want a way out of, of the hardship that the, a lot of people endure over here. So they find a Western, they get married, and after a couple of years, so you can't bring money over here and invest it in Bali, uh, except under limited circumstances, and we'll go into that later, but Essentially, if you've got a, a, a Balinese partner, they can buy land, they can buy, buy a house. So you can get married to a Balinese or in, in Indonesia, you can build a house, you can buy land, you can um, set yourself up for retirement. And if that relationship falls apart, you get nothing. They own the land because they're their name, not yours. You're not allowed to own land uh, under most circumstances in, in over here as an outsider. Um, once you've been here for a long time, you've got different visas and all that sort of stuff, it changes. But certainly, to, to come over here with, look, you can buy a house for, over here for 50 to 100,000 Australian dollars. Um, they're not gonna be great houses, but, but certainly the starting point, you buy land for that money quite easily, and you can build your own place. So, 
if you don't have a lot of money to retire to and you're sitting there, well, how am I going to support myself? It is a, a, a possibility. I know places for under $1,000 a month where you can live in, in, in luxury with swimming pools and with, with uh, carers, with um, cafes and warungs and stuff right down the road and the beach, just a short stroll up the, up, the, up the path as well. So the concept of coming over here is, is fantastic. How do you get here? What do you do? Well, the first thing I do do is come over here as a, as a, as a um, visitor for three months or two months. The maximum you're allowed to stay on a visa on arrival is one month extended to two. So at least come over here for a couple of months, but don't stay in hotels. Once you get here, start looking around and I can help put you in touch with a good network of, of expats who are living in retirement facilities. They're not necessarily old person's homes. They're resorts like this one here. It's a beautiful place. And there's a lot of people here, expats and, and um, people from other countries that have come here retirement or fully retirement state. So networking with people like that. I've got an in, uh, 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 some information about a company that I've used personally, my immigration attorney, who has been very, very helpful. They even run um, networking evenings so that they can get people together so you can find out who to talk to and get some, some information. If you don't talk to people that are doing here and, and here, having gone all through the heartaches, you're going to end up in the same heartaches as well. So look, I'm gonna, I have a little talk to a mate of mine, Steve. I went up to his restaurant the other night. He'll tell me a little bit about his journey. It wasn't fun, but it's not over. And he's, he's got a beautiful, beautiful restaurant. Um, and we went up there for dinner. And then I'll come back and we'll have a little bit more of a talk about where to from here and the rest of the series that I'm gonna be doing, including some amazing uh, locations to, to stay. Um, as I said, we're gonna look into the legal side of things. And we're gonna look at the other options like working uh, visas and and investment visas and, and as much as you can do to maybe spend some of your time. There's a, there's a new visa just come in called the second home visa. Um, and it's not for everyone, but it does give you an opportunity if you've got a few dollars behind you to be able to sit and have somewhere that you can come and stay for half the year or for you know a, a year about. I think it runs up to five years or something. So look, don't cry me. I'll, give, I'll bring the information when the time's right. But for now, I'm just gonna sit back, enjoy my bintang. I'm at a place called the Hidden Garden Bar. Now my mate Ron owns this, and um, he's been here I think 30 odd years. Uh, this bar is frequented by hundreds of, of Australians mostly, that nearly all of them live exclusively. If you didn't know this place was here, you would never find it. But if you jump on, on Google and put Hidden Garden Bar, it's in Sonoa, it's not too hard to find down these little back alleys and pathways, and it's attached to this beautiful resort, but I'll tell you what, let's go for a bit of a wander and we'll see who's at the bar. There's always a few good old buggers there having some, some talks. There's couples, there's families, and, um, and there's bloody cold beer. He keeps his beer in the chest freezer, and I'll tell you what, it's so nice, you can't go wrong. The best thing about this place is if you want to have a chat, you can always come up. G'day, guys. Wave to Australia. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Well, he's got me name up on the buddy board. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, oh, here he is again. Hey, that's that's the culprit. It's all his fault. Just explain to these guys how you've got a special license in Australia. You can drive fast, fast, fast past schools. <laughs> <laughs> well, they won't let me. They won't let me stop long enough. If, if I pull over for more than thirty seconds, <laughs> here's a couple of other old buggers here. They look all the all the blokes up here are regulars. You get your own nickname. I don't know what mine's going to be. Blabbermouth or something, probably. Oh, <laughs> but hey, check this out. So, once you, how long you got to be here to get up on the wall? <laughs> Look at this. So all of the all the regular patrons have got caricatures on the wall, <laughs> and they're funny. Oh, okay. there's that ugly bugger in the middle with the Hawaiian shirt. Uh, who knows? <laughs> but it's a great little bar, and it's a great little place to start if you want to move to Bali and you want to find out where to go and who to talk to. These guys have got a wealth of information because all of the people that they talk to know a heap of other people as well. So, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna go and talk to Steve and we'll come back and we'll have another chat. So, I'm at the Happy Buddha and I've just had some of the most beautiful Indian food. They've got such a great menu here. They do some nice lobster, but I'm gonna save that for next Monday, I'll go back to seafood.
A mate of mine, I met him a while back and he went up the mountains with us and helped to feed some people in the villages in, in remote parts of Mali. Became really good friends. And Steve came back to Mali, uh, oh, what, six months ago probably now? Yep, October. Yeah, back in October. And he found a place that, that was almost abandoned, I guess it had been shut down during COVID. Yep. It was looking pretty run down. And he was offered the place at a bloody good price. He went, oh, wow. Well, this, is, this will justify a few trips over the ditch. So he went and bought or, or made an offer and, and, and took over the lease of a place in Banoa, which is not far from Jimbaran and Nusa Dura. Great little spot. I love Banoa. It's a little bit out of the way, a little bit quieter and nice and easy to get in and out of. But this is Steve, my old mate, owner of the hey, Happy Buddha. How are you? <laughs> and I, tell you, I just want to ask you, Chris, I'm doing this little series on moving to or retiring in Bali and I guess part of your motivations for for being here was to set up a bit of a, a legacy something you could come back to or something to justify coming here how what what structure or what did you have to do in order to be able to have a property or have a, a business set up in Bali what was the the first move the first move was trying to work out um, how we get all the permits and how we actually go about opening a business in Bali. Is it the same as Australia, whether you have your ABN number and your um, sole trader, or but it's obviously not. It has to be a company. You, sole traders, it doesn't work here in Bali. So it was getting a, an association that would fix us up with the permits and how to start a company. So the first thing you needed was a, like a, an attorney or a... Like an agent. All right. Yeah. And that, they're easy to come by? They were easy, but then I had two or three different quotes that varied from setting up a company at four and a half grand Australian dollars to the one that I finally went through, which was two and a half thousand Australian dollars for the same thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, and, and the process of going through that. Um, I just, one thing I do really want to talk about is because the rules tend to change a little bit in Bali um, and what you take for granted as, as being gospel one day may not be the case uh, in six months time and when you're investing tens of thousands of dollars you want to make sure that your investments covered so you've set up a company here in Bali now yeah. and you're allowed to work for that company as well you're allowed to work here in Bali or are you basically an owner in, in name only, or what's the story? Basically just the owner of the company that you can oversee things, you can't actually work. Okay, so you're not allowed to get out behind the bar and... Not allowed, not allowed to get behind the bar, not not to... Uh, you, you can't show yourself working, cleaning, trying to help the staff. No, you can just sort of oversee it. Let allowed to sample it. the food and the alcohol? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, so <laughs> strictly for quality assurance and training purposes, I promise you. Absolutely. Because we're doing it again just to make sure this is still cold. <clears throat> uh, so, a lot of people tell me, in order to own property or to to work in Bali, you need to have a Balinese partner. Is that is that the case? Not anymore. Years ago, it was. Um, which I already had teed up, ready to go. And when I spoke to the agent, they said, no, they said, you can open up a company, but you must have a partner, whether it's Australian partner or Indonesian, it doesn't matter. Oh. Um, yeah, and then whatever comes under that company banner, whether you buy an R of, of property, land, you want to build a villa, you want another business, it all comes under one banner of that company. Now. Well, that's interesting. So you can actually own land yes. if, you've, if you've set up a, a, a company here in Bali. Yes. Okay, well that actually answers a lot of questions because people turn around and say, one of, my, one of the ones you often hear is, you've got to get married to a Balinese, and then there's a whole heap of girls who will, or, or generally girls, who will take on the, the, the job of getting married and then turn around a year later and say, um, I want my land and <laughs> kick you out. Um, and you end up with nothing and you've got no, almost no way of fighting it so correct yeah so that well that's interesting um look every every bit of advice we're giving here is is personal advice it's not legal advice by any stretch of the imagination and the laws change and there's some new visas that are coming up or that are coming in or they're coming back so look this is not to be taken as gospel but we'll try to give you a bit of a guide on 
some of the things to watch out for. So look, for this, for the point of this exercise, Steve's come over here, he's leased some land, or he's leased a building. building yep. He's set up his business, his company, and now he's allowed to trade here, but he's not allowed to work in his own property. He's, he's basically here as an investor, I guess. Yes. Um, are you allowed to take a wage or take money as an investor back out of the company, are you? I can, yes. Okay, so, yeah. there you go. Um, Bali, the lifestyle in Bali is, it seems nice and idyllic and pina coladas on the beach and all that sort of stuff, but behind the scenes, I know I've been renovating my house and I've found on a very, very simple scale, some of the most annoying complications and stuff. Um, a lot of language barrier issues that make it really hard dealing with tradesmen or dealing with contractors. Yep. Um, dealing with government departments and all that sort of stuff. If you've got someone that speaks the language, you're, you're sort of halfway done. But, yes. But if you don't, tell me about some of the, the, the pitfalls that you've found out the hard way. Well, um, once, once you go through an agent um, to set up a company, you expect that you know that they they give you a quote of what things cost and what you need to set it up they they categorize it all really well it all looks fantastic you pay the money you start the process which the process takes months um or can take months but then there's certain things once you get the paperwork through from them you think that's the end of it but it's not there's other things that they say that you need to find out for yourself you need to register for say um, I just found out last week I have to register for um, tax local tax so I'm thinking that I've set up a company with the company tax already set up from right. from my agent why wouldn't the agent say okay you also need to set up local tax this is how to do it we can do it for you nothing I had the tax man come here looking for tax and I had no idea. Um, and there's there's other little hidden taxes like you got to pay the local petroleum or the banjo or something for parking or for permission to be able to have nighttime entertainment. Or have you have you encountered that? Haven't yet because we haven't sort of done much loud music. But I, I think here the curfew is around eleven o'clock yeah. because we're right in front of um, Peninsula Beach, which is a timeshare resort. Yeah. So their clientele's a little bit, you know, older than us guys. Yeah. So we've got to respect that. Um, so I haven't dealt with any of that yet. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of little things. A lot things. of hidden charges, a lot of time delays. Yeah. A lot. Um, like even just um, we're coming over this time. They, I paid another um, two and a half thousand dollars Australian to get a two-year kitus, which is a two-year visa which I'm not ever going to use so that I can get an EPOS machine in the restaurant. This is a requirement from the bank that the Indonesian government are requiring. And what that means is I go for a two year visa that I'm never going to use. I also need to show them that I have a res residence in Bali, a permanent residence, which I've had to get my friend to co-sign saying that I live with him. All right, so... Look. <coughs> Um, it's complicated and and it's it's a lot more expensive than it looks up front yeah. um, and I know his story has been pretty 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 dicey along the way just because the changes and the sudden turns and whatever um, but I've got to say what you've done with this place is just it is phenomenal it's a beautiful place and it's you've got Beautiful surrounds, beautiful gardens. You've got right across the, world, uh, the, the, the road from one of the biggest resorts yeah. in the peninsula, in this yeah. area. Yeah. Um, and, and on one of the more, more um, I, look, I think Vanilla's got a lot to offer. People have done it. They've got the water sport park just down one end. You've got some more water sport park at the other end. So you're right, you're right yeah. in the middle of, of beautiful protected waters where you've got fishing yeah. and, and everything you can ask for. Um, so, look, I really do wish you the very, very best of luck. Um, Thank you. I'll keep coming back here because, look, today I, I had my chicken tikka masala. <laughs> oh, my. they've got a, they've got a Indian chef or a chef, to, a local chef who's Indian trained, and I haven't had some really a good curry for so long. And it wasn't hot, but it was bloody beautiful, really spicy, and like good, good, solid, solid flavours. Um, 
they do a whole heap of different food on the menu. Um, the Happy Buddha. So we'll give you a plug for it. Thank you, man, because it's. Um, would you do it again if you if you had the chance to start all over? Me personally, with my finances back in Australia, um, no. Uh -huh. No. If 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 it was something where you had an endless amount of investment cash or something in your bank and you needed to get rid of it and do it, then then yes. But I've begged, stealed, and borrowed to get to here. And the mistake we make as Australians or wherever we're coming from is we think this place, Indonesia, Bali, is going to work the same. You're going to get the same information, but you don't.